Now, if you've got your Bibles this morning, I want you to take them out and open them to 2 Samuel chapters 22 and 23. 2 Samuel chapter 22. We are nearing the end of the life of David and what a life it has been. Uh, chapters 22 and 23 of 2 Samuel are kind of like David's last words of sorts. It's David's summation of his life, his kingdom, and his ministry. Uh, I always find, by the way, last words or, or any attempt to summarize somebody's life or their business or their mission in a sentence, I always find those really intriguing to see how they you know, kind of captured in just a few words. Recently, uh, I saw a list with some really creative taglines that local businesses, uh, local businesses have given themselves. For example, a man named Dave has a septic tank cleaning business locally, and he named it Dave Septic Services. We are number one in the number two business, uh, which is just amazing. Uh, even better though was the tagline on his septic tank removal truck, Yesterday's Meals on Wheels, uh, which is pretty disgusting, but I got to hand it to him for his wit. Uh, one of my favorites, a local plumbing company chose the tagline, we repair what your husband fixed. Uh, so that's definitely who Veronica will be calling at some point. Uh, sometimes the summation of one's life comes in the form of last words. Elva, Elvis Presley, some of you saw that movie recently. His last words at a press conference were, I hope I have not bored you. I hope I haven't bored you, which if you know anything about his life, seems fitting. Sometimes these, these life summations will appear on a tombstone. Uh, the epitaph on TV show host Merv Griffin's tombstone reads, in fact, I have a picture of it, I will not be right back after this message. That's what he actually chose. Um, here's one from old, old colonial New England. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it, but here's what it says. Here lies my wife. I bid her goodbye. She rests in peace. And now so do I. <laughs> so ladies, does that seem mean? Does that seem mean? Well, here's another one from a wife's tombstone in New England. Uh, and Margaret lived with her husband for 50 years and died confident in the hope of a better life ahead. Uh, that's fantastic. And then finally, one that I love just for its simplicity. Here lies Ezekiel Akel, aged 112. The good die young. You have to wonder who chose that as his epitaph. Well, I share that because in 2 Samuel 22 and 23, the editor of 2 Samuel uses a song that David wrote at a, a previous point in his life to summarize David's whole life. David actually wrote this song right after God had delivered him from the hands of Saul many years before, probably 40 or so years um, prior to the end of 2 Samuel. In fact, the author tells us that in verse one. Take a look at it in your Bible. Um, verse one, chapter 22, David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Well, Saul's been off the picture for 40 years, so this song at the end of 2 Samuel was written 40 years prior to this. But now the editor, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, puts this song at the end of the book of 2 Samuel to wrap up David's whole life and capture all of David's major life themes. By the way, this is also Psalm 18 in the book of Psalms. Textually, it is important to note that the editor puts this song of David here at the end of First and Second Samuel to mirror the song of Hannah that he used to open, uh, to open the book. Um, Hannah's song and David's song, let me turn this around here, are like bookends, bookends that are going to crowd the entire books of First and Second Samuel. We're gonna kind of encapsulate them. That's what these, I don't know why they're uh, spacemen, but um, this is Hannah and this is David. That's the only thing I could find in my library that did the job. Um, so we went through Hannah's song on our first week. It was the first book in. Uh, if you can't remember that, go back and listen to it this week so you can hear these incredible parallels. Hannah opens her song in First Samuel 2 by saying, God is a rock. Well, David opens his song the exact same way. Verse two, the Lord is my rock, he says, and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge and my savior. Hannah says in the first song that God will lift up the humble. David says, I was the humble that God lifted up. Hannah said that God would provide for Israel a king. David says, I was that king or at least I was the beginning of the lineage of that king. Hannah's song is prophecy. David's song is the fulfillment of and the affirmation of that prophecy. 
Both Hannah and David rejoice that God is the salvation for those who are weak and the savior for those who are overlooked or oppressed by others or their enemies. Again, these two songs form bookends, bookends on these books of First and Second Samuel, and they make for beautiful symmetry. Now, I'm not gonna read this song in its entirety. I hope that you will do that this week if you haven't done it yet. What I'm gonna do is draw out three dominant themes from this song, three truths about God that David believes that his life illustrates and proclaims. And as you write them down, I would encourage you to consider what three or four things about God you would wanna communicate to your kids what your life would illustrate or what you would wanna communicate to those in your circle of influence when you die, okay? If if your life were a song, what, what would you want it to emphasize about God? You may not be a poet, but if your life were written as verse so that others might know it, what would you teach them so that they wouldn't blow it? Okay, see what I did there? You don't have to make yours rhyme, but, but here is David's three themes. Number one, God is my hope. God, my hope. Let me again read verse two. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior. Now verse four, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Y'all, if there is one thing that David's life teaches us, it is that God will be the strength and the shield and the sword for all those who trust in him. God was David's strength when David, as, a, as an unlikely young shepherd boy, was anointed king of Israel. When nobody else believed in David, David believed in himself, not because of some silly self-esteem, but he believed in himself because he knew God believed in him and God was with him. God was David's deliverer when David rushed out to face Goliath. Knowing that God was with him gave David a courage that nobody else had, not even Saul in all of his armor or even his most choice soldiers. God was David's shield when when David hid from Saul. In fact, in this song, David calls God his rock. David had hid from Saul in and behind literal rocks as Saul chased him around those rocks for several months. In fact, they kept going in and around the same set of mountains. It's almost like parents when you're playing tag with your kid and one of you's on one side of the kitchen table and the other is on the other. And you you go one way to catch it when they go around. And so the table's always between you. David was saying, God, this giant rock here protected me from Saul's arrows. But my real rock, my real refuge from danger, it was never a mountain. It was never a piece of granite. It was always you. Knowing that you were in charge was my table of peace in the presence of my enemies. If there is one thing that David's life screams at us, it is hope in God. It's where all of David's confidence came from. I love how Hudson Taylor, the missionary to China, I love how he said it. All of God's giants, all of them, have been weak men and women who did great things for God for one reason. They just reckoned on God being with them. That's all they were. That's where their courage came from. It's where their effectiveness came from. They just knew God was with them. That's it. Weak people, shepherds who know that God is with them. God's giants are weak men and women who reckon that God is with them and their hope for any kind of success is not in their abilities, it's just in the grace of God. And they apply that goal to literally every dimension of their lives. Parents, it's how we're supposed to think about raising our kids. My hope in my parenting is not in my parenting skills or lack thereof. It is in God who will show grace to my kids. One of my favorite parenting books is Elise Fitzpatrick's Give Them Grace. Now, just a little heads up, it doesn't have all the practical tips that parents like in a, in a, in a child raising book. I've got other books for that. In fact, I'll post those on social media this week since I know some of you parents will will be asking me now that I said that. But um, that's not this book. I love the book, Give Them Grace, because in it, Elise Fitzpatrick points out how so many other books on parenting seem to guarantee success in parenting if you will just follow this basic strategy. And a lot of the strategies are great. They're biblical even. But then she points out that God was a perfect father and a third of the angels and the only two humans that he created directly rebelled against him. So she's like, so you think you'll be able to out-technique God? The really dangerous problem with this kind of thinking, she says, is that it keeps Christian parents from the one thing they most need, and that is to cast themselves and their kids on the mercy of God to work in their kids' lives. She points to 1 Peter 5.10, which says this, and after you have suffered a little while, 
That's a great description of parenting, isn't it, parents? After you suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Who's gonna restore you as a parent? Who's gonna restore your kids? It doesn't say that you'll eventually find your groove or the winds of fortune will change or what doesn't kill you makes you stronger or kids are resilient or they'll turn out fine. The averages say that. It says, no, God will himself, if you trust in him, himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. The greatest thing that I can commend to you as a parent is to actively hope in the grace of God for your kids because your great parenting skills will fail you. But your God will not. All of God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on God being with them. See, that means, parents, when I get up in the morning and I feel overwhelmed as a parent, I say, well, I don't have to go figure out how to be a parent today. God is at work in my kid's life. And he is my rock and my shield and my horn of salvation for them. I just need to join him in what he is doing in my kid's lives. Y'all see the sovereign God, the ancient of days, Israel's rock, the sustainer of the ends of the earth, the alpha and the omega is with me in my parenting. The one who walks on water, the one who raised a little girl from the dead, the one who guided David's rock in the way that would bring the giant down, the one who made the lame walk and the blind see, that is the one walking with me through this day's parenting challenges. I'm gonna be okay. My hope for my marriage is not in my ability to keep things together. It's not even in my Christian marriage techniques that I preach to you all about. My hope is in God whose mercies are new for me and Veronica every morning. Our confidence for tomorrow is not in our ability to provide for ourselves. It's not even in how much money that we've set aside. Our hope is in the one who says, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches in Christ Jesus. My hope for my future, after I have messed things up with sin, after I've ruined relationships with bad choices, my hope is not in my ability to pull myself up by my bootstraps above my sin. My hope is in God's willingness to weave redemption into the ruin of my sin, to bring beauty from my ashes, to create triumph out of my tragedy and to bring resurrection out of my death. He is my rock, he is my refuge, my strength, and my horn of salvation. All God's giants, all of them, have been weak men and women who did great things for God because they just reckon on God being with them. Sometimes I'm asked by younger church planners who they see the size of the Summit Church and they see some of the things, they're like, hey, what's the one secret to building a great church? I'm like, all right, you want the one secret to building a great church? And they're all excited, they got their notebooks because they wanna write down. I tell them, this is gonna be the most disappointing thing you've ever heard. But I'm like, if I have to boil it down to one thing, just one thing, I'll tell them to put all of their hopes for success in God's mercy and not their ability. In fact, a lot of times I use Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which is a verse that most of us learned as a kid if you grew up in church. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 say, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Don't lean on your understanding. Don't lean on your ability to lead a church. Don't lean on your ability to figure it out. Don't lean on the set of books that you're reading or the the models that you have. Don't lean on your ability to innovate. Trust in the Lord. In all your ways, acknowledge him. In other words, acknowledge your dependence on him and then he will direct your paths. And that's the kind of church you want, one that God builds. That's where I point out the God's preferred metaphor for us, for me as a leader in the Bible, the preferred metaphor is sheep, which I've told you many times. It's both good news and bad news. The bad news is sheep are idiots, right? I mean, I have told you that the eyesight of sheep is notoriously poor and their heads hang really down low. You put those two things together. They can't see more than five or six feet ahead of them, which means they usually have no idea where they're going. You never see a sheep up on its hind legs, like checking out the terrain going, oh, that looks good over there. That looks safe. No, they're dumb. They step into streams and they drown. They step on uneven parts of the path and they tumble over and become cast like, 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 like a cockroach and they die. Or they eat and eat and eat in a circle until there's no grass left and they're basically consuming their own waste. That is the metaphor that God chose for your pastor. That's the bad news. The good news is we have a shepherd who loves to lead sheep when they are dependent on him and when they'll just acknowledge that dependence. I tell young church planners that the best ideas in the Summit Church, the best ideas, the greatest gifts that God gave to our church did not come through my careful planning or brilliant strategery. The greatest things in our church were unexpected interruptions, 
gifts of grace that God put into our path because we as a church, y'all for 21 years now, we have trusted in his mercy and not our abilities. Put your trust, I tell them, in the Lord. Put your trust in the God of all grace who will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. What David came to realize is that God had orchestrated his life to teach him that. Have you realized that yet? But look at verse seven, look at what David says. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I called, if I'm really God's servant, why am I in distress? God put David into situations, he realized, situations of distress where every earthly help had failed him and no earthly strategy could save him. Well, that might be where you are this morning. Early on in this series, I told you the story of what they would do back in David's day if they had a sheep that was prone to wander. It looks to us on the surface very cruel, but they would take the, the staff and they would break the front legs of that wandering lamb. And then the shepherd would bind up those broken legs that he had just broken and he would hoist that sheep onto the back of his neck. And for the next three months, everywhere that shepherd went, he would carry that heavy lamb around his shoulders from place to place. And they say that when you did that after the legs were healed and the three months were up, he would take that sheep off his shoulders. And when he put that sheep down, that sheep would never wander again. Because during those three months, that sheep had learned that all that he really needs to thrive and to be successful and for safety is just to be close to the shepherd. Y'all, David had multiple moments where God did this with him. Where's God doing this with you? Is it in your parenting? Is that where you feel distress? Is it in your marriage? Is it with an addiction you just can't seem to shake? Where are you experiencing heartache and frustration and failure? He wants you to do what David did in my distress. I called upon the Lord. As we say a lot, sometimes God will, put you, God will put you flat on your back so you will finally be looking the right direction. God wants you to learn the four words that will absolutely transform your whole life. Those four words, God is always faithful. Again, Hudson Taylor, missionary to China. God wants you to have something far better than riches and gold. Hey, do you believe there's something far better than riches and gold that I can give you right now? Something better than riches and gold and investments and stock portfolios? Something better, Hudson Taylor says, than personal charisma or talent? That one thing that he wants to give you is, get this, helpless dependence on him. Y'all, I've spent my entire life trying to avoid being helpless dependent on anybody, right? I don't wanna be helplessly dependent. He wants you to learn helpless dependence, y'all. And see, look, if dependence is the objective, then weakness becomes an advantage. If the whole point is helpless dependence, then don't beware your weaknesses, beware your strengths, because your weaknesses are those places where you will likely experience God and his strength and your strengths are where you will forget him. David's first thing he says is God, my hope. Here's the second thing he says, God, our savior. God, our savior. When David first wrote these words about God being his horn of salvation, his deliverer, you know, he had no idea, no idea the extent to which he would need these things to be true. See, when David first wrote these things, he thought of them mainly as God's promise to save David from his enemies and to deliver him from those people like Saul who were trying to destroy him. What David did not realize was that the main way God would deliver David would be from himself. See, by the time we get to this point in the book of 2 Samuel, we're not sure how to feel about David anymore, are we? I mean, in some ways, David has been a great king. He's shown great promises as a king. He's done some amazing things, some very inspiring things. But then again, we got that terrible Bathsheba incident. And then he's murdered Uriah, one of his most loyal men. And then we got Tamar's story and Absalom's story, which present David at best as an absent and disengaged father. David, by the way, at 2 Samuel 22, still lacks the courage to remove men like Joab from the head of the army. Joab, who was an abusive and murderous tyrant. And so the words of this song put at the end of David's life have a deeper meaning than David first realized than he wrote them. God is going to deliver David and save him, not just from his enemies, he's going to deliver David and save him from himself. 
We end the books of First and Second Samuel realizing that these books are not ultimately about David. <laughs> By the way, here's an interesting textual note. The books of First and Second Samuel don't record the death of David, which would be odd if First and Second Samuel were primarily the biography of David. I mean, what kind of biography would fail to record the death of the central figure? <laughs> but y'all, that's the thing. First and second Samuel are not meant to be primarily the story of David. They're supposed to show us how David point us to another king, a greater king who would be that righteous king that Hannah prophesied would come, that king that we've always craved, that king who would himself be our rock and our refuge and our deliverer and our salvation. In the last verse of this song, David points us to this coming king. He says, great salvation he brings to his king and he shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David, watch this, and his offspring forever. David ends this whole thing looking forward to his offspring. He's looking beyond, he's looking for another savior. And y'all sure enough, 970 years after David died, in the skies above a hillside just outside of Jerusalem, or it should be outside of Bethlehem, a vast multitude of angels appeared proclaiming to another group of humble shepherds, unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. That's the word that David used in 2 Samuel 22. When David said in this song, God is my savior, he had no idea how much he would need that to be true. At this point in the book, we see that David's ultimate hope was anchored in that one-way, unconditional promise that God had made to David in 2 Samuel 7. Y'all remember when we went through that chapter? That chapter started out, David saying to God, God, I'm gonna build something great for you. I'm gonna build you a temple that will be renowned around the world. It's gonna be the biggest thing anybody's ever seen. And God corrected David and he said, David, no, no. This whole thing is not about you doing something for me. This whole thing is about me doing something for you. David, you would never be able to build me anything. You're too weak. You're too sinful. You're going to fail. In fact, David, you're about to make some decisions in the next few chapters of your life that are not only gonna devastate your family, it's gonna devastate the whole nation. This is not about what I'm going to do for you. Excuse it is not about what you're going to do for me. It's about what I'm going to do for you. Friend, listen to me. Every other religion in the world, every religion in the world, except for the one that is taught right here, every religion in the world is spelled D-O. Do. Do great things for God. Be a good father. Be honest. Be kind. Give money to the church. Do great things. and God will accept you. God will reward you. The gospel, the gospel of David is not spelled D-O, it is spelled D-O-N-E, done. It's a one-way promise that you simply receive. It's not about what you do for God and he rewards you for. It's about what God has done for you and gives to you so that you can glorify him for. So let me say that again. It's not about what you do for God that he rewards you for. It's about what God has done and gives to you that you then glorify him for. And that brings us to the final and what is perhaps the best, though most confusing, part of this song, write this down, number three, God, my restoration. Look at verse 22. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and I have not departed wickedly from my God for all his rules were before me. And from his statutes, I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him and I kept myself from guilt and the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. We read this and we say, uh, David, bruh, blameless is not the word that I would use to describe your life. How could Bathsheba or Uriah, or Tamar, or any of us who have read the stories right before this chapter say, oh yeah, oh yeah, David was blameless and clean. Squeaky clean is the word I would use to be exact. He has kept the ways of the Lord and he did not depart wickedly from his God. Why would David say that? And why would the editor include it here at the end of David's life? Well, as I say it, y'all, there are three options. And I need y'all to really lean in here. In fact, maybe even physically actually just lean in, okay, literally. Because this is gonna be a little bit deep. I'm gonna need you to put on your theological big boy pants for just a minute, okay? 
I have three options as I see it. You ready? Option one, hagiography. A word I guarantee you, you have not used yet this year. Hagiography is a fancy word that means that you tell the most polished version of a person's life. You leave out all the bad parts. You turn them into a hero. I remember, for example, as a kid, reading a biography of George Washington. And it was basically like, George Washington did no wrong ever. He walked five miles to repay a penny somebody had overpaid him. He could not tell a lie when he chopped down the cherry tree. And really he chopped down the cherry tree, cherry tree for good reasons anyway. He was dauntless, he was fearless. He was a man with no flaws. And that's why America is awesome. And y'all hear me, George Washington was a great man. He deserves to be a hero, but we know that George Washington, like many great men, had inconsistencies, grievous inconsistencies. If you don't believe that, read Ron Chernow's 2010 biography of him and you'll see that. So is the author here of 2 Samuel trying to, trying to heroize David? Is he trying to whitewash David's past? Well, no. I mean, the same author that put this here also recorded all the bad stuff in the preceding chapters. And he's not trying to pretend that what he just recorded didn't actually happen. Whitewashing somebody's past is not only dishonest, it is also harmful for victims. Because it's hard for somebody who's been deeply hurt by somebody else to sit there and hear us talk about how this or that person was perfect or how that era of history was perfect when they really suffered at the hands of the person or those people that we are lionizing. In fact, I've heard victims of abuse say that being abused was bad enough. But then to see that victimizer presented as if they had no flaws, that's even worse because it makes them, the victim, feel completely invisible, like their past pain is irrelevant. So no, I do not think that's what the Bible is doing. The sin that David committed was real. The pain he caused was real. The Bible has been crystal clear about that. This is not hagiography. This is not whitewashing. So option two. Option two, let's call that positional righteousness. I told you, lean in for just a minute. Big boy theological stuff. Our section option is to say that these statements about David's righteousness are about David's positional righteousness in Christ. After all, the gospel is that God gives us Christ's righteousness, right? When you trust Jesus as your savior, your sin becomes his, his righteousness becomes yours. It's called gift righteousness, not earned righteousness, gift righteousness. I've told you before that it's almost like you and Jesus are sitting together in a class taking a test and you didn't study at all. So you fail spectacularly. But Jesus always studies perfectly, always does the tutoring sessions, always works late at night. So he aces the test. But when it's time to turn in your papers, he takes yours and writes his name on it, then gives you his and writes your name on it and turns them in that way so that he gets your failing grade and you get his ace. At the cross, Jesus took our sinful record and he died for it. And then he gave us his perfect righteousness. So is that what's happening here? All these statements about David's righteousness are really about Christ's righteousness? Well, I mean, it's certainly true that we receive Christ's righteousness and David had also. But y'all, there are several things in this text that do not quite fit with that explanation. Did you read it? That indicate that that's not really, it can't be the full answer. I mean, look at actually what David says, verse 21 according to the cleanness of my hands. Verse 22, I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not wickedly departed from my God. Verse 23, from his statutes, I did not turn aside. I kept myself from guilt and the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness. Over and over again, David uses the word my. If David is only pointing to the righteousness of Christ, that's an odd way of describing it, isn't it? No, y'all, it is clear that David here is referring to actual good things that he himself did. Not good things that Jesus did, but good things that David did, which leads us to option three. This is the right option. New creation righteousness. New creation righteousness. The third option is that this final song of David demonstrates for us the reality and the power of God to restore the believer. Let me point out something to you that David said. Listen to me, what I'm gonna say here in the next few minutes is going to absolutely change some of your lives. David said this, Psalm 103. The Lord does not deal with us according to our sins. In other words, David's sins are off the table. Compare that to the exact same language in verse 21 of this song where David says, the Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. God did not deal with me according to my sins, which are real, but he does deal with me according to my righteousness, which means David's 
righteous acts stay on the table. David's wicked deeds, off the table. David's righteous deeds, still on the table. David had sinned grievously. God does not remember those things anymore. We come to the final song about his life, and there's not a mention of that. David was also the humble shepherd boy who depended on God when the world was arraigned against him. David showed real courage when he ran out to face Goliath when everybody else sat like a coward on the sidelines. David showed incredible patience and faith by not taking matters into his own hands when killing King Saul would have made things so much easier for him. David showed extraordinary grace and generosity and forgiveness to his enemies, and God does remember all those things. Y'all, that's incredible. Because of salvation, God does not remember our wicked deeds, but he does remember our righteous deeds. And that means... And this is gonna change somebody's life today. Because of Jesus, our lives can be defined by the good that we do, not the sins that we committed. See, I'm talking, I'm talking with people today who have sinned grievously in your past. And I'm not trying to minimize that. I'm not trying to whitewash what you did. The pain that you caused was real. And in many cases, it needs restitution. And in some cases, your choices have lasting earthly consequences. There are certain kinds of abuse, for example, that mean you will never be able to re-engage certain kinds of relationships this side of the resurrection. But the good news of the gospel is that even with the reality of those sins, your life can be defined not by the bad that you did, but by the works of faith and the good that you have done and will do in Jesus' name. Y'all, the final verdict on David's life, the final summation of his life, the label that scripture gives to David was not abuser, compromiser, negligent father, or murderer, even though all those things were true. The label over David's life, the final verdict is humble man of faith, blameless one, gracious man of God, and man of courage. Because of your past, you might label yourself divorcee, cheater, thief, adulterer, absent father, abuser, criminal, compromiser, Coward, alcoholic, failure. But God's got a new label for you. And from this point forward, your life can be defined not by the sins that you committed, but by the works of faith and love that you're gonna do. And it is high time for some of you to get on with that. You need to stop wallowing in the shame of your past and get on with the good that God has for you. You need to declare with David, God, my restoration. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 By grace, Paul says, we have been saved through faith and that's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. It's all a gift. It's not of works lest any man should boast. God sees me, Paul says, in Christ. Christ's righteousness is given to me as a gift. Oh, but then we leave out the next part of that verse. Go on, you can't can't stop it in verse nine. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Why? For good works that we should go and now walk in them. Why have you been recreated in Christ? What did God create you for? What did he save you for? He saved you for good works. God saved you for the good that he was gonna do through you. And from now on, your life is gonna be defined by that. By the way, the Greek word that Paul uses for workmanship there is poema from where we get our our, our word poem or song. In other words, God wants to write a song about your life too. Like 2 Samuel 22 was for David's life. And the melody of that song, the chorus, the refrain is not about the sins that you committed. That's not what defines your life. It's about the works of faith and love that you pursued after you were forgiven. You wanna know how God wants to define you and label you in the future? It's not according to your sins. He does not remember them. He wants to define you according to the works of love and faith that you do. See, all this is when God is at his absolute best. I listened to a message recently by the famous African-American evangelist, E.V. Hill, one of our, our worship pastors, Hank Murphy, sent it to me. It was called When God Was at His Best. In that message, Dr. Hill goes through a litany of things in the Bible where we see God's awesome power on display. He starts with creation. Dr. Hill says, we look at the vast expanse of the stars, the breathtaking complexity of the human DNA strand, things that boggle our mind. And Dr. Hill says, was God at his best there? I mean, those things were amazing, but God was not at his best in creating even those incredible things. Dr. Hill then says, and I can never truly imitate him. I tried in our Thursday service, it did not go well. 
Rich Bowman over our, our downtown Durham campus, he can do this, but I can't do it. Dr. Hill, I won't imitate him. Dr. Hill says, and then God made this beautiful country of ours. He made Florida, gave it white sand beaches and beautiful vistas and the keys. He made the South. He gave it tobacco and cotton and produce of every kind. He made the Midwest. He made it abundant and wheat and corn. He made Texas and gave it to cows. He made California and then gave it to the hippies. <laughs> oh, he said, then he made North Carolina. He just decided to live there, right? <laughs> God was certainly showing off, Evie Hill said, when God made this great country of ours. By the way, you say, wait, you didn't mention New Jersey or, or the Northeast. That's right. God is not to blame for that, okay? Man <laughs> made that. I'm just, ki I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. But again, Dr. Hill asks, he says, was God at his best when he created this beautiful country of ours? No, 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 he said. It's amazing, but God was not at his best there. Well, how about in the Exodus, he asked, where God brought the people of Israel out of Egypt to the mighty plagues led by a pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. Was God at his best there? No, he says, not even there was God at his best. Well, then we fast forward to Mary's immaculate conception where God overshadows Mary and makes her conceive a son though she had never known a man. And the baby she gives birth to was fully God and fully man. A miracle of miracles. The incarnation was God at his best there. No, he says, not even there was God at his best. Oh, so we come to the cross and resurrection and surely we say, surely God had to be at his best there. No, he says, even there, even there, says Dr. Hill, God was not at his best. No, Dr. Hill says, God was great in all of those places, but God was at his best when he came into the life of a little 12 year old boy, he says, and saved me, changed me and made all things new in me. He gave me a hope and a future and cleansed me and made me whole. It's what the angels and Peter, Peter says, long to look into what they can't understand, what makes them close their mouths and wonder and just say, I don't understand how it happened. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space, but when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. Y'all, there is nothing quite so spectacular as when God takes a life that is ruined and marred by sin, like your life, like David's life, and makes it new. When God takes what sin has broken and destroyed and breathes new life into it, when God takes what you have ruined and he says, I'm not gonna remember that anymore. And your life is not gonna be defined by the sins that you committed. Your life is gonna be defined by the works of faith and good that you do because you are my workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And you thought I was showing off when I created creation. You thought I was showing off for the cross. Wait till you see what I'm gonna do in your life. That's when God is at his best. So it's no wonder, it's no wonder that David closes this Psalm, the Psalm of his life, glorifying God's power and redemption for this. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing praises to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king for this, for God's power of restoration and redemption. Friend, the salvation that God has offered you gives you three things. It gives you forgiveness. That's what we always talk about. Your sin has been paid. That's important. Second thing is it gives you the power to overcome sin. We talked about that a few weeks ago. God gives us not only forgiveness from sin, he gives us the power to break the cycle of sin. But here's the third thing. Listen, he gives you healing from the damage of sin. Isaiah 53, six says, by his stripes, we have been healed. The cross not only gives me forgiveness, the cross included provision for my complete and total healing from sin. We can pray for healing from all of sin's damage on the basis of the cross. Listen, you can even pray for physical healing, healing from our sicknesses based on this. Does that mean that God will always physically heal? No, I mean, sometimes the full healing doesn't come until we get to heaven, but just because we don't experience the fullness of that healing in this life, doesn't mean it wasn't included in the cross or that we can't ask for an early installment of it. This morning, God's cross offers you forgiveness from the penalty of sin. It offers you the power to overcome sin and it offers you healing from the damage of sin. Because of the gospel, you can say with David, God, my hope, God, my salvation, God, my restoration. And there's no better picture of that than baptism. Of any, there's no better picture of any one of those three things in baptism, which we're gonna give you a chance to do. 
This is the most important symbol in the New Testament. It's our first act of obedience. It's what identifies us. It's what, it's what, it's what puts on display the miracle of salvation in the New Testament. Peter compared our baptism with the Exodus. He said, just like God took him to the Red Sea and it was like the waters parted. He said, when you get baptized, it's like you're leaving behind the plagues of Egypt. You're leaving behind all the tyranny and captivity of Egypt. You're leaving behind the diseases of Egypt. Well, Paul, who's never one to be outdone by Peter, said, no, 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 Peter. It's, it's actually better compared to the death of Christ. We symbolically are entering into the death of Christ. And when you go under that water, all your old sins, all your Bathsheba and your, your Uriah and your Tamar and your Absalom moments, they're dying. And when you come up out of that water, you are leaving all that behind and you are raised to a new life that is defined by good works. You are raised to be a person who is no longer defined by the sins that you committed. You are defined by the works of faith and love that you do. Have you done that yet? About 70 of you are about to, and there are probably dozens, maybe hundreds of you in here that have not done that yet. And you need to join this group that's being baptized this weekend. Now, some of you haven't done it yet because you've never known that you should. You're just finding this out. Some of you've never had the chance. Some of you just started a relationship with Jesus in the last few weeks. And like I said, this is supposed to be your first act of obedience. Others of you, you just keep making excuses. Ah, later, I'll do it later. Which I always say, how in the world are you supposed to convince anybody, including Jesus, that you're serious about obedience to him if you won't obey the very first thing he told you to do? It's like if you got married and then told your wife after you said I do that I'm not going home with you tonight, I'm gonna hang out with the boys tonight. That's not a great way to start off your marriage. If you're serious about following Jesus, then obey the first thing he told you to do, which is to put on the wedding ring and identify yourself. Some of you have more practical excuses. You're like, oh, well, I didn't bring clothes. My hair, I spent so much time on my hair. Listen, we're not good at a lot of this church. We are super good at this. Over 15 years, we have compiled every possible thing. you We got changes of clothes. We got stuff for all of you that will take care of you. We, we, we thought of it, okay? God's been planning this. We've been preparing for it. It's gonna be like, well, I rode with people. They're not gonna wanna wait. I, I promise you, lots of people listening to me right now will drive you home after your baptism if your friends are too selfish and ungodly to stick around and wait for you to be baptized. I promise, okay? <laughs> now, a little insider knowledge here. They're actually willing to wait for you because that's why they invited you today, okay? So they're super excited about this. They would be happy to wait for you when you do this. Some of you are like, well, I was baptized when I was a baby. And I always say to this, it's like, we respect that. In fact, that is so, it's awesome that your parents, when you were born, they baptized you in the hopes that one day you would grow up and follow Jesus. That's what the baptism meant, right? But see, baptism in the New Testament is supposed to be your own declaration of following Jesus. So whose faith was being shown when you got baptized as an infant? Well, what yours, it was your parents. And thank God for your parents' faith. So now you get a chance, listen, to ratify their decision. They decided for you when you were a baby. Now you're like, now I'm grown up. I'm gonna choose to go along with that. You're not rejecting their baptism. You're fulfilling it. You get a chance to call them this afternoon and say, mom and dad, guess what? 18 years ago, 25 years ago, 40 years ago, when you baptized me when I was a baby, you were hoping one day I would grow up and follow Jesus. I got good news, mom and dad, I'm doing it. I'm following Jesus. And today I ratified that first baptism. I ratified it to say, it is not just my parents' decision, it's also mine. Some of you are like, well, I got some questions. I'm not sure, but all I wanna do today is start the conversation with you. So in a minute, we're gonna give you a chance to do that. You're gonna have a chance to start a conversation where you and a person can talk about whether or not this is the right thing for you. So here's what I'm gonna have you do, okay? At all of our campuses, at all of our campuses, right now, I want you to stand to your feet. Everybody, everybody stand up. We got teams at every campus that are moving into place, okay? They're gonna be in the aisles, they're gonna be down front, okay? So they're kind of getting into place. And in just a minute, in just a minute, I know this sounds childish, but I'm gonna count to three. And that's just so everybody knows exactly when it's supposed to happen, okay? When I get to three, two things are gonna happen. First thing is everybody's gonna erupt into crazy raucous applause because they're just excited about what God is doing this weekend. They're excited about you being baptized. So everybody's gonna start clapping at every campus. 
Second thing that's gonna happen, when I say three, is you're gonna use the cover of all that noise and that clock to step out into the aisle where somebody will greet you and we'll go and get this process started, okay? Today, right now. By the way, I see, this is not a great time for some of you guys to be going to the bathroom. <laughs> Series of misunderstandings could lead you to a place that you didn't intend when you step out in the aisle, okay? So just hang with me for just a second, okay? So you clear what we're gonna do? Like, don't wait, don't delay. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Today is the day for you. When I get to three, we're all gonna go crazy clapping and you're gonna step out. You're like, ah, I feel self-conscious. I don't wanna go alone. That's fine. The person next to you is happy to go with you. Just right now, tap them on the leg. And that means you're gonna go together. Nobody should come alone, okay? All right, here we go. On three, you step out. Everybody else gonna clap. One, two, three. Come on, step out right now. Go, 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 go. Step out, step out and make your way to the aisle. They're coming right now. Here we go. Come on. Our worship teams are coming at all of our campuses. 